we are going to move into our spectrum pulse for the evening. And this will probably be a little bit long, but I think you guys are going to enjoy it and find it informative. Um, so let's do, do, do. I need to go back up to the top and I'm going to have to open up tabs. As I'm we mulling go, over what you said still, and it's kind of stick in my head and I don't like it. What do you, what, what? The whole Pegasus not looking like it should. You got to go watch the episode, man. I, I've seen at least some of it. Give me my but... views. Give me my views, Nez. I want my views. <laughs> no, there's, there's a lot of really good lore behind it. And, you know, the, the, the reason I like, don't want to go watch it is because if you if you convince me, <laughs> I, Tree, don't I don't want you to make sense. I don't want like, you to make I, sense. You don't get how emotionally attached I am to this ship. <laughs> like. I've got an yeah, idea this, for you. Nez. This was like my ship. This was like the, the, my. I've angle. got an idea. This has always been. Once you're done with the bulk. Build the Pegasus. How how it was. You know, after you're done with the bulk, then build a Pegasus. And then, you know, you can do a, a role-playing thing in it or something like that. Or find a way to import it into Space Engineers or something. I don't know. Or, or, I, or I can convince CIG, like, hey, I'll pay you, like, five grand if you can, <laughs> if you can make me a vintage pegasus if that's an option um i will pay them a lot more than five grand for my uh <laughs> my my uh um uh, lpd he's ready to throw like five thousand down the old pegasus. i need it all right that's a total of 10 john <laughs> 10 Crew, grand for listening? a pegasus cag do you dare <laughs> 10 grand for a vintage pegasus yeah all right, so uh, like we talked about earlier, if you weren't here <laughs> earlier, um, we are going to be doing our Spectrum Pulse this evening on the road to 100 star systems. Um, and you may not have seen the podcast episode that Nazareth and I did on the ship backlog and the ship pipeline, but we did a pretty a somewhat similar Spectrum Pulse on those, talking about you know what their plan is and how they're what they're what they're doing in order to get rid of the you know to make their way through the ship backlog well they have a plan for making their way through all the you know building the star systems because we only have one um essentially two if you count pyro being you know all but finished at this point and, and almost then, three with levski being in its own system yeah and then odin for squadron 42 and who knows what else is in squadron 42 but you know, we know that they're, you know, they're essentially done with, you know, multiple star systems, you know, at least to the point that Stanton is done. Um, obviously, that, you know, number of five is a far cry from 100. Um, the Montreal ship team is going to be helping with the backlog. They, um, the reason they're building that ship team is to increase throughput. Um, and that's one of those things that Nazareth and I talked about in that episode is, you know, with the growth of we talked about the growth of CIG, the planned growth. Part of that planned growth is in, you know increasing the size and scope of various teams in order to increase throughput. Whether it's throughput for vehicles or star systems or you know um, outfits for your character, you know deliver you know um, interactables for and uh, props for your hab and your ship. Um, you know, all that, uh, all these things, you know, they, they are hiring more people to use the tools that they have been developing and refining over the years. And so Nazareth and I are going to talk about a bunch of those tools and the tech that have been developed. But um, there's a, to, to start this off, and Nazareth and I, we're going to, we're going to do kind of like what we like to do with like the monthly reports. We're going to sort of alternate. Um, we've broken this up into segments um, and, um, we're going to alternate where you know I'll take a piece and then Nazareth will take the next piece in order to keep things uh, flowing nicely. But uh, we have a lot the the show notes for this episode for this segment is a lot. There's a lot of information that Nazareth and I have been digging up, um, and we're going to show you all of it as well as read through you know summarize things. But you know if 
you can't watch this full episode right now. You can go watch, back and watch it later. If you don't want to watch the whole thing, you can just check out the show notes and the episode description on YouTube and you can look at all this stuff for yourself and, and you can be like, oh my gosh, you know, this paints a very clear picture of what's going on. So um, I was re-watching this video um, when um, we were doing the episode on quantum um, and, and, you know, where Tony Z is in quantum. And this quote really stuck out to me. And before we play uh, that, this first section is kicking the production into overdrive. Yes, yeah, this first the header in there. Yep. Production into overdrive. You know, we've, we've named these. And I'll, uh, as Nazareth is doing... Um, uh, so I, I'm going to cover one bit and then we each have a segment under this and then uh, I'll open up the rest of the tabs because we got a lot more tabs for the different parts because we're going to cover the different parts of a star system that CIG has been building tools in order to make, in order to fill up a star system with not only locations, but content. Um, so it's, yeah. Yep, and uh, make sure we're at the right That's spot. Correct. Yeah, okay. Oh. So. Maybe. Thus far, we've been focused entirely on a single system, Stanton, which includes four planets, 12 moons, 225 economic nodes, 44 trading outposts, 13 rest stops, and 50 asteroid fields. So yeah, it's really big. The point of this presentation then is to give you a better understanding of how, when the first one's taken so long, we're aiming to kick things into overdrive so that we can deliver new systems much more quickly. This involves obviously a lot of... Okay, so, um, oh, I thought I had closed captioning on. So he talks about how there's so much, oh, there was an ad. Okay, so Tony Tony Z, this is the 2940, the CitizenCon 2949 2019 presentation on quantum when he first introduced quantum to us. Um, and I'm sure Nazareth and I were both watching this and drooling at the same time because we couldn't close our mouths while we're listening and watching. But this is the very beginning. And so um, he, he points out, you know, uh, thus far we've been focused on a single star system, Stanton. Talks about how, you know, all the planets and the moons, the economic nodes, you know, the, the outposts and stuff. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the shops, you know, at the stations, um, asteroid fields, etc. It's really big. And he's like, uh, he goes on to say the, the point of this presentation then is to give you a better understanding of how, when with the first one, a, the first star system has taken so long, we're aiming to kick things into overdrive so that we can deliver new systems much more quickly. first one's taken so long, we're aiming to kick things into overdrive so that we can deliver new systems much more quickly. This involves, obviously, a lot of different areas. Procedural generation of terrain, modular art. Procedural generation of terrain. Planet tech. Sets, algorithmic detailing of buildings and interior. Modular art sets. The modular art sets is totally... Um, the uh, um, Rastar tool. That's a modular system with art sets and everything. And as they build it, it just automatically puts in the art sets based off of what they're looking to build. And it comes prepackaged, ready to go as part of the module as they connect all these modules together. Uh, along with the procedural locations tool. But detailing of buildings and interiors. Interiors and a lot of other stuff. Algorithmic, so different areas, procedural. Generation of terrain, modular art sets, algorithmic detailing of buildings and interiors, and a lot of other. So it doesn't catch the algorithmic part um, on the closed captioning, but he says algorithmic detailing of buildings and interiors. So what Algorithm did we is just... just another way to say procedural, but yeah. Yeah. What did we just see on ISC about building interiors? How they're going to build all these buildings, but they're going to use the tools. Chat GPT they... buildings. Chat GPT buildings, yes. Uh, give yes, but actually, GPT. no. <laughs> well, yes, but no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's. I mean, you're you're not wrong, Shimpasta, because it, it's kind of how it is. 
where yeah. the designers basically tell you know the 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 tool this is what i want in 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 it within this space this is what i want and then it the tool has a rule set and then brrr, it's done you know and that does like 80 percent of the work you know, that's how the procedural uh, locations tool uh works and they're building it that way so that way they can use it for um asteroid facilities underground facilities they it's already it already works for stations and I guarantee you they're going to use it for the building interiors. So that way they don't have to hand place all of this stuff. They just have a rule set for b- different building types. And then it will generate a building interior out, you know, lo- you know, procedurally. So that way they're different, but they have the things that are required in them. But they look different on the inside. They're different organ, you know, set up differently. So let's listen to the rest of the quote. Other stuff. For the purposes of this talk, though, I'm going to focus on what I call the dynamic content. So dynamic content being quantum. So he just talked about how they're going to use these tools in order to build the things within a star system. The planets and moons, um, they have tools for the spacecaping, you know, asteroid, belt, you know, asteroid, um, asteroid fields, asteroid belts, um, the uh, gas clouds, you know, a nebula. But then he also mentioned, you know, basically says in fancy words, talks about the tools that they later showed in this CitizenCon as well as later on with Rastar, with the procedural locations tool, um, and how those things all tie into, you know, Quantum, the system that he is developing, as well as other systems to create dynamic content. And that way they don't have to hand make everything. All these systems feed into each other. All these locations feed into these systems to create dynamic content. And then they add to that with handcrafted content. You know, they they polish it, but a lot of it is just dynamically generated and and living and breathing. So it's a, a, a holistic process that takes a long time to build. But once it's built, then it just builds on itself, you know, using algorithms, using procedural generation, um, you know, in, in a tool set manner. So I thought that quote was really, really interesting and very uh, enlightening about um, CIG's methodology, you know, the, their, their, the method to the madness, you know, the, the, the recipe that they're working off of. And, you know, they, they, they they tell us straight up, you know, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. This is the plan, but people miss out on these quotes and without, you know, these quotes and then understanding the things that he was referring to, you don't have the context in order to put all the pieces together to really understand where they're going with this. You know, he, they told us in 20, in 2019, you know, three over almost three and a half years ago, you know, that CIG has a plan to kick production of star systems into overdrive in order to, in order to fill up, you know, fill the game up with locations to visit and dynamic content for those locations. It says it verbatim. So it's it, pretty interesting. Um, and let's see, the next part is the road to release presentation. And um, let's see, where are we? Should be where you're supposed to be. Yeah, make sure. Uh, 1440. Here we go. Yep. Actions will mean something in it. And that. So he just got done talking about full persistence, PES. This is where we are right now. This is from the 2948 uh, Road to Release presentation at CitizenCon 2018. I was here with Paul. Um, for this presentation. Uh, the the night before, Paul and I got a, a little bit too tipsy. I was still hung over at this point, but I was so excited and I had so much energy drinks on, on board that I wasn't feeling it. Um, but this is where we are with full persistence in PES. You know, and it's taken longer to get here than they, they originally thought because of, you know, the, the, the research and development of building a system that will handle PES for at the scale that, you know, our persistence at the scale they needed to. But then a very, very important part, the 11th pillar. And the last one, if we go forward, Paul, 
uh, is server meshing. So when we get server meshing, uh, that is, we think, the last piece of the puzzle to have the full game experience. And this is our ability to go, you know, right now we have about 50 players on a server. We probably will be able to increase that number because of bang following and stuff. But it's still going to cap out as bang following. Oh, man. Closed captioning always yep. cracks me up. Bind calling. Level. With server meshing, we'll be able to get to thousands of players playing concurrently in the same location, star systems. They're not all going to be able to have 1,000 people dogpiling together. They won't be able to render it all at the same time. But you certainly will be able to have you know, 1,000 people on the planet of Hurston, for instance. Um, and uh, so the server meshing is the last key piece, because that will allow us to have a truly massively populated universe of players as well as AI, and having servers that dynamically scale up and down to take care of the processing needs of that. And uh, so from our standpoint, in terms of what we would think is the experience when you guys can sit in and play the game day after day and not worry about it getting wiped, not, not worrying about, oh, I'm going to do something for a day or two and there's no point because they're going to reset the system. When we get to full persistence and server meshing, that is, that's our marker. And sure, after that, we've got, a, we've got planets to do and star systems, and we're going to have continual feature development. But this is an online, live game. And so for us, we don't have a particular viewpoint in terms of, oh, that's it. This is where we finish it, and we don't do any more work. It's like literally, our, our, we, we kind of view, as long as you guys want to live in this universe, every three months, we're going to So another important piece of context in that you know we are PES is in they've got a, a few more things to iterate on in order to stabilize it and add you know some more functionality to it but they are you know they just showed us the you know their big old uh, server meshing summit they've been doing a server meshing summit you know every year for several years now you know they didn't just start working on it folks um but um you know server meshing is in full production, you know, and, and these, they've been working on the services, you know, the microservices that feed into it for years. And so it, it's, we are on the cusp of server meshing and granted, it's going to take probably, you know, all of this year just to get static server meshing into the PTU, you know, um, and then next year we'll be getting it into live and then, you know, working on dynamic, you know, the various iterations of dynamic server meshing. But, you know, literally, you know, this year we are, we are on the, the cusp of, you know, that, that final pillar, you know, uh, they still have to work on things like the organization system, you know, and, and better integration into the game. You know, that's part and of one of the Literally pillars. everything else. Yeah. But, you know, as far as the, the major pillars of the game, you know, that's, you know, th this is where we're at. But he also mentions how they're going to continue to build star systems as they continue to develop the game, you know, um, you know, post server meshing post pes but they need to have pes and server meshing in in order to incorporate more star systems and star systems that persist you know, in the way that we you know we as players want them to so that way we you know we get that impact of feeling like we are building something we are doing something that matters it isn't like wow where you come back to that zone that you were just in and all the npcs just respond and you know everything's back to the way it was you know uh, when you first walked in you know yeah, server meshing is the end of the beginning. Yep. Um, and this next bit is NAS. Ooh, oh, I had it pulled up and it loaded it back up the top. Well, fun. Uh, That's super fun. All right. So continuing on the overdrive con conversation, we had a very nice chat letter from the chairman. So I'll read it mostly word for word and we'll kind of summarize we as we go. So this part was taken when they when he started talking about their plan and how they're going to roll out and what kind of technologies go into the current vision that they're working on right now for server meshing. So we will start with static server meshing, where different servers are assigned to simulate different entity zones in a star system. So a planet or a collection of planets, basically, they'll be assigned what they're going to cover. We'll cover why that's, well, how that will differ later on. Entity zones, sometimes referred to as local grids, are separated or separate simulation areas. 
The inside of a spaceship is a different zone to the space around which the spaceship flies. A planet is a different zone than the star system zone where all the planets and moons exist in. And a landing zone can also be a different land a different zone nested inside the planet zone nested inside the system zone. Boxes within boxes. At first, the servers will be bound to fixed zones, but we quickly move to dynamic server meshing v1, where we will assign server where we yeah, where we assign servers dynamically to entity zones based on gameplay and simulation load. This will be much more efficient use of servers in the cloud, as you only need servers where players are, whereas in static server meshing, you have servers assigned to a zone even if there are no players there. So, the first version, the version we get, hopefully by the end of this year, is they say, basically, Art Corp and Hurston, you're in Server 1, Microtech, uh, Crusader, you're in ver you're Server 2. Even if they spawn, like, launch the server and literally nobody's in the, the star system, the server's still running. So that's they're completely just burning money on that server. Absolutely just burning the money. Even if one player is on Crusader and the other 90, well, I don't know, 200, however the server cap goes up or whatever, is on Artcorp. Or all the players in the entire star system in that shard are in Pyro and it's still simulating uh, Stanton. That's, that's what they're going to run into with static server meshing. Um, but they, like I said, quickly move to dynamic server meshing one. And that gives them the ability to not fully dynamic, but the zones that they have laid out will be able to be dynamically assigned anywhere. So a planet or a landing zone, a spaceship can be gifted over to a different server. And that server can take more authority over different zones or less authority, depending on how many players and what is their load on the server itself. So when we go from static, which is two, which they said two servers per star system, dynamic can be one or it could be five, depending on what limits they place on it. Now we get into dynamic two. So dynamic server meshing two will take the dynamic assignment of the server one step further by subdividing entity zones into simulation islands. This is an organization. This is organizing the dynamic objects in one zone slash local grids into groups based on which objects can interact, collide with each other. Allowing these islands to be distributed between servers to, again, help balance the simulation load. At this point, we should be able to handle tens of thousands of players all playing the same PES universe shard, bringing Star Citizen much closer to the ultimate goal of a huge living universe densely populated with players and AI. So, the thing that makes Dynamic 2 so much better than Dynamic 1 is that it doesn't have to say, well, I can do Area 18 or I can do all of Art Corp. Dynamic says, or Dynamic V2 says, okay, well, a lot of people are in Astro Armada, but no one's in really Mighty the rest Bridge of the, is a uh, plugin. Uh, area, uh, the rest of the landing zone. So I'm going to keep my authority over Astro Armada, but the other server that's generating the, you know, the space around Art Corp can have the rest of the landing zone while it shrinks the simulation and will focus more on that one place. Or it could say, well, there's only like one or two people on Art Corp, so I can actually take on more load and I can take uh, the space around it, maybe the couple of the Grange points. And it doesn't have to be any set zone. Or it could even say, well, there's a lot of load in this one spot. Let's say a, a ship show going on on Daymar. Well, normally... The Crusader area server takes care of Daymar, but a lot of players are going there, and they've even somehow, I don't know how they do this, maybe NPC crew or something. There's a lot of NPC there as well. So maybe all of the NPC load is going to be on one server, collisions are going to be on another, so that the server can better handle different layers of the simulation all taking place around Crusader. That is the power of Dynamic 2. It can even split up different kinds of chores, whether that be, let's say, collision or different kinds of simulation or different kinds of interactions. So maybe like the 
uh, flying goes onto one server and landed go onto another server. I don't know all the different objects that can interact or groups that they have. Uh, these are probably terrible explanations of the different groups they have, but it can split them up. This allows the server to be very efficient with not only the space, the like digital space that it actually uses, but also subdividing these jobs so that even if we have much more players in the same spot, loading a lot of NPCs, it means that the server can still be under a lo or under the max load while running nicely. So, to recap all this, we get static server meshing, hopefully by the end of the year, in some form. But the second that that is on live servers, or even PTU servers, they are furiously trying to get to Dynamic 1. Because Dynamic 1 will save them from burning cash on empty servers. Once they get to Dynamic 1, they have lots of refined time to get to Dy Dynamic 2, which will be able to have the full version and the most optimized version of dynamic server meshing or server meshing in general, which will let us have what they're theorizing, tens of thousands of players all playing together in the same shard. Now, eventually this A shard will be an entire hundred systems, but tens of thousands of players. So I think, unless you have any comments on that tree? Nope. Nope. All right. Very thorough and yeah, that's the w without server meshing, you know, the, the the point of ramping up production on all these star systems yeah. is meaningless. And, you know, the the, the foundation for ramping up production, like Tony's was talking about, is server meshing, you know, and that's why they've been working. You know, Nazareth, you've said this you know, many times. Um, this is why they've been continuing to work on pyro you know, as, you know, the, you know, w when iCash didn't work out. And iCache not working out, delayed the release, delayed work on server meshing, you know, delayed work on quantum. And so when that didn't work out and they had to go back to the drawing board and reinvent this and create PES, well, they had all this extra time. So they continued to work on the tools. They continued to work on Pyro. They continued to flesh all these things out in order to, you know, continue to work on this process of, hey, we need to eventually... Once we get to the point, we need to be able to build star systems, build them rapidly. But we do we don't want to work on like five different star systems right now, because you know uh, uh, because we don't have any place to put them once they're done. So we're just going to continue to refine our processes while we're waiting on server meshing, in order to get Pyro be the most complete it can be, and then once it's in, you know, then you know they ramp up production just like he just talked about. You know, they so this they, has been. So, so far, this has been a lot of the foundational stuff of what the, like the foundation, or what I just mm -hmm. said, behind what we're going to talk about. Now we're going to yep. start talking about the tech that they're using to actually build the things now using the tech we've talked yep. about and the release schedule that we talked about. There's a reason so. that Sprint for Nix was added to the progress tracker, and then they didn't do more work on it. Because when they added it to the progress tracker, they thought server meshing was going to be a lot sooner than it is, or than it oh, was. Yeah. And I, I would be willing to bet we see that sprint pick back up again, that deliverable pick back up again this year um, at some point. Because, you know, with Pyro coming online, they are going to want to get to work back on Nix uh, very soon um, and wrap that system up. Yeah, I imagine we'll be hearing what our next system after Nix will be next year, mm -hmm. for sure. So let's see. Now we're moving on to spacecaping. Oop, this one. There no, no, stop. Yes. Oh, dang it. <laughs> it just wants to go, Sometimes. man. Why? Yeah, I hate how whenever I open the tab back up, it starts to, yeah, you know, it pick, it starts to play again. It's like, no, 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 no. I will tell you to play yeah. when I'm ready. Uh, so uh, there's a option somewhere you can tell YouTube to not autoplay. Uh, I was today years old when, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we are we're we're uh, we're starting off with spacecaping just because a lot of the space within a star system is not filled up by planets and moons. There's a lot of empty space, and they've talked about with spacecaping filling up that space with things that are visually appealing, but that also have gameplay implications. And they've talked mentioned how 
with the gas clouds that they are, you know, that they have, um, how those gas clouds will have gameplay implications as far as, um, you know, affecting sensors, giving play, places for, for you to hide, um, affecting your, uh, how fast you can travel through quantum, you know, all these things, the, the visual gas clouds that we see have a probability volume and they can add um, properties to that probability volume in order to make it so that way it's not just visually appealing, uh, but um, you know it, it, it has function. It's not just a, a set dressing. And so uh, this clip was from May 1st, 2020. Um, when they were working, at, you know, this is sort of like the one of the first ones when they were really showing off the gas clouds. Um, and I thought it was interesting because, let's see, at 57.17. So this was a Star Citizen, uh, a SEL, Star Citizen Live. And basically, he just went through the process of creating a, a gas cloud um, and how it all works. And... Uh, let's see, it's at, yeah, right there. So look like, in, yeah. and, and of course it goes without, it should go without saying, but we're going to say it anyway, this is, uh, less than an hour's work. Yeah. Of what oh, done. yeah. So, 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 <laughs> so what we're, what we're showcasing here, what we always showcase on game dev is not, it's not even a close approximation to what can actually be delivered with the, with the tools at our disposal and uh, the work of many folks on the team going through and optimizing and cleaning up. And Yeah, let me show you some details. So obviously those gas clouds weren't very detailed, but they were just throwing them in there together because they were showing off the tool that they're using to build the gas clouds. Um, and uh, that tool, one of the tools that they use significantly, many of the developers use, is Houdini. And um, so they use Houdini for a lot of different things you know, on the, the, the art and design side. And so they go through, and um, this is on May 1st, but he was showing, no, don't play. Okay, cool. And all right, show and script, close captions. Okay, cool. In tech updates, on Friday, viewers of Star Citizen Live got an in-depth look at the gas tech being developed for both Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Now, what we showed on Friday's show could be done in about an hour, but what you're seeing here are tests that are much farther along. The idea here is to explore where we can add texture to the spacecapes of the persistent universe, with this test specifically for those wayward space stations found between the planets of the Stanton system. Now this is look dev in its purest form, as artists explore what's possible as opposed to building something specifically that you'll find around one station or another. Now once the capabilities have been identified and the process is developed and streamlined, this work will form the basis for gases found throughout the persistent universe, including in asteroid fields, around space stations, near jump points, and beyond. Find All right, so there's a lot of important language in there. Um, how they talked about, you know, this is early look dev, you know, this is them uh, working, the, you know, identifying the process, building the process of how they're going to make these gas clouds and the, the nebulas. Um, and then going through that process, practicing and then streamlining the work. So that way they have a workflow that is efficient and they can also identify the tools that they need in order to be able to work faster, you know, to not only... Um, increase the shorten the flight time of, of making a gas cloud making a nebula but increase the throughput you know how many they can uh, build in a given time with the number of people working on the tools you know uh, using that uh, shortened flight time and the you know that's why this stuff is really important because they showed the guy using the tool and they're like hey we can make a gas cloud really quickly you know in a short period of time and as you know, we refine the process, we can make more and more of these things and make them prettier, but also make them far faster, you know, by identifying the, um, the hiccups in the process and, and identifying what tools we need the tools teams to build for so that way we can build them faster. And then we'll watch this last clip really quick. Oh, there it is. The Grey Cat Industrial Tools, the two-handers that I really want. I can't wait. Um, this. But up next, asteroids. Friendly space potato 
or a rocky, dangerous adversary. The Planet Content team has created a new pipeline for better looking and more varied asteroids, and they're coming your way in the upcoming Alpha 313. Rocks are boring, but you still need them for the big picture, and if they don't look good, then the big picture will, will suffer from it. I do have a knack for finding solutions to, to problems, not necessarily only the ones that are very difficult to find, but also for things that are just like inconvenient. The main reason why we needed new asteroids was that the old ones um, were using and relying on old tech. Based on that, we wanted to update the process and the assets. As the Star Citizen universe keeps on expanding, um, there is a need for more variety for asteroids um, and that's why we built that new pipeline to allow us to iterate and create more variation much more quickly than before and with a better quality as well. Okay, so hopefully you guys picked up on the language that he was just talking about. So the old assets that we had before 313, you know, they used old tech, they were not very performant, they didn't look all that great, and making asteroid fields using that tech you know, and asteroid uh, belts was a time-consuming and not efficient process. So they created a new pipeline in order, you know, they built a new pipeline in order to be able to not only build, you know, uh, new asteroid fields and new asteroid belts more quickly, but also to make them look better and to be able to add more variety to them. Um, because if you watch the lore equals gameplay vids that I do, if you follow the um, the updates to the Galactopedia, um, there have been new. If you go and you read about the different asteroid belts that are mentioned in the Galactopedia, there is a lot of descriptors in them about how you know what the asteroids are like, um, and they have they they talk about you know not only just visually but how they're made up, and then there's hints you know about what is in them. And so they, you know, this is part of that, you know, this was in winter 2021, so March 8th, 2021. They're ramping up. They know that they need to be able to deliver more variety for asteroids for other systems because the asteroids are going to look different. You know, it's a, it's a, a, um, astronomic, astronomical thing, you know, that not all asteroids look the same. They're not all the same, you know, based off their makeup and the way that they're formed. And so they built a process in order to do that in order to do it faster, in order to do it in a way that looks better, you know, and so that way as new systems come online, they can populate them with asteroid belts and with gas clouds, you know, and not just gas clouds. When I say gas clouds, they're not just talking about the poof clouds, but um, they're going to use the same tech for the nebula that surrounds the, I think it's the glacium ring in Nix. They're going to use this to fill the entire... Um, Oh gosh, I just did it in a lore equals gameplay update um, for the Galactopedia update. But there's a whole star system that's just only a couple of jumps away that is literally, it's an, it's filled with a nebula. The whole system is, is going to be gas clouds and flying through these nebulas, you know, the, the nebula within the star system because the star basically, it, you know, um, went into a nova phase destroyed a few planets and those planets you know once it shrunk back down you know those planets you know the that what was left of them got turned into a, a nova essentially or a a, a a nebula and so you know that's why they had to build these tools so that way they when they get to these systems they can quickly you know you know, put these nebula in them, these gas clouds, you know, around jump points, wherever they want them to. And they can put the asteroid belts that are in every, you know, in most star systems, um, you know, and asteroid fields in there, but they can put them in there, you know, quickly, you know, almost with a click of a button, but also create more variety. So that way they look visually different, you know, so it doesn't feel like the same old thing over and over again. Um, and then to wrap up the spacecaping aspect of it, I pulled up a few deliberal, de liberals, deliverables on the progress tracker. Um, the first one is, let's see, it's the Soul Ed uh, SDF editor. And so this was just a little work by the Planet Tech team um, way back in 2021. Um, so this sprint was in, showed up in 2021, but right here is where the progress tracker starts. So this work was ongoing before that. Uh, but it's the sole SDF editor um, it, it is for um, asteroids. And so it's improve and expand how asteroid field entities are set up on a system scale, including editor support for setting up the asteroid field SDF 
assign distance field inside the solar system editor. So this was the work that, you know, part of the work that they did in order to make the, uh, the new asteroid pipeline that they just talked about. Um, and this was way back, way back when, you know, they were doing this because back then, you know, they thought pyro was coming sooner. We were working on it, but, um, they did this in order to update the asteroids as part, you know, in Stanton. See, it's a uh, sign distance field well. also will help them, um, dither out the asteroid field as you get in or out of it. Yep. So where the air and halo gets very, very, very dense, a sign mm -hmm. distance field is literally a way to calculate mass depending on points of a field. So for the shields, it says, okay, here's the ship. The shield has to be exactly on that point, but two feet away or two meters away, whatever you want to call it. So it's able to make a a bubble around the ship that's the shape of the ship. Mm -hmm. So, and this is bringing all that into the Soul Ed editor, which literally is point click star system kind of thing. Yeah. This, yeah, this is what allows them to, in editor, be able to use the new asteroid uh, pipeline, the new workflow, in order to build these things in the editor instead of having to build them outside of the editor and then import them. And then, oh, you know what? This isn't import right. This doesn't look right. We have to go back to the tool that we were using. You know, it, it's, you know, again, part of that new workflow, new pipeline to do things faster, make them look better, um, and be able to add more variety for the myriad of star systems that we're going to have. Stanton Asteroids. You know, again, this work, you know, occurred, you know, prior to this date because this is when the progress tracker started. Um, but creating replacements for the asteroids currently used in the same system using the new organic asset workflow. So in order to test out this new workflow, in order to build out this new process that they will be able to use over and over and over again and continue to iterate on, you know, they redid the, stand the asteroids in Stanton. That's how they practiced. And then the last one is the Sharp Angular Asteroid Pack. Um, all tasks involved in creating and implementing sharp angular asteroid packs for use in the pyro system. So they, you know, added, they, they created the new, uh, a, an additional asteroid pack as part of the, using the new pipeline, you know, it, it basically ended here and then they created new asteroids for pyro because they thought it was going to be ready um, using that new pipeline. And here it is. And this is how long it took them to take that, create that new asteroid pack, you know, and then they use the, you know, the editor to basically just place them and then boom, 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 you have asteroids here. Um, and it's done, you know, and it isn't a you know, bunch of hand placement, you know, you know, stuff is, you know, creating a procedural tool for, you know, and a much more efficient workflow for creating new asteroids, you know, uh, both visually and in, in function, you know, when it comes to, to mining them and what's inside them. Um, but then uh, allowing for that to be done in editor far more quickly when new systems come online. Um, and that's it for the uh, spacecaping portion. So, you know, as far as, you know, filling in the, the space in between um, planetary bodies and such with, you know, visually appealing things, but things that also have gameplay function. Um, and now we're going to, let's see, oops, I need to, where's my other browser? There it is. Um, Nazareth is going to talk about planet tech. All right. So to give what we're about to talk about a little more context, we have a two preceding uh, notes to give kind of a, a barometer on how fast it is when we last heard about the speed of building planets. So. Way back in the January month, January 2016 month report, we heard that Hurston was in previs. They were just starting to work on what Hurston was going to look like. And then in Alpha 3.3.5, we got the added planet Hurston. So that's about two years and 10 months after they announced starting previs. That being said, in a YouTube link that I assume Tree's going to pull up. Uh, let's see. So is it? Is it that one? I don't know which one it is. Let me hit the button here. Uh, oh, it's going to open up there. Uh, the adventure begins? Yes. Okay. 
They mentioned how fast they got the literal entire Stanton system rebuilt from the ground up. But Microtech will be there. Um, and actually, when we roll out V4, we had to redo every single planet and every single moon. So we did that actually in two months, yes. which is a testimony of how quicker the workflow is. So not only is the quality better, but the workflow is much better because we basically redid everything that took us about two years and two months, uh, which is a really good sign for the future and creating uh, more content. But in 3.8, we will have Microtech. That's huge. God, that's huge. So we went from two years and two months. I have two years and 10 months from previs. So previs is a little bit before they calculated started work. So they, either way, a little, out, a little over two years to two months on an entire system. So when we go to Nix, when we go to whatever is after Nix, Castro, whatever, within a couple months, like within six months, they will have the planet tech portion of the system done. Which means, and that's assuming a long art period of adding foliage and rocks and textures and things for each planet. Which not every planet has unique art. For the ones they do, let's assume six months. That's two star systems a year. At least. At the very least. But that's two months. Okay, let's assume two months. Two... Four, six, eight, ten, twelve. That's six systems. Six, six systems with three planets, eleven moons. A year. And we know a lot of them are a lot more sparse than that. A lot of them are a lot more sparse. So, and that's that was way back in... When was that video actually taken? 2019? 2018? That oh, was... Uh... Yeah, this is tw December 2019 from 2019 2019. Con. Four years ago? What do you want to bet? It's much faster now. Yeah. So yeah, the, the fact that again, they could the, do like, that many planets and moons in two months, three years Back ago. then, when they were like just started using this new planet tech. That was yeah. the first couple months of V4 being done. And they're over that fast. Now they're like, hey, let's make a studio over in Turbulent to do this for us because it'll be like an afternoon for them. Like, that's their job now. Yeah. And I almost guarantee there's already been some previs done on many more systems. Like, to get the resources done they need to. Like, the concept art that we saw at CitizenCon for Pyro had been done way before they started Pyro. So those those concept sheets that we saw back when they started working on Pyro, the SysonCon right after they started that they started showing Pyro, they probably had those for a lot more places. So again, why is Pyro taking so long? Because we need server meshing to put it in. But it means they get to have a higher standard to aim at when they go for the next one. So Next up, we have. You pulled up a video. Monthly report. I think yeah. I pulled them up in order from what you had on the the OneNote. I have a letter for the chairman next. Oh, did I miss one? Whoops. Yep. Server meshing four point zero. So and... they want server meshing four point zero. Watch it. As an early technical preview to Evocati at the end of, or they wanted as it, at the end of 2022 in Q4 in PTU. So they wanted Evocati to be in server meshing at the end of 2022. That's when they scheduled Pyro to be done. I wrote this two weeks ago. My brain's a bit fried. Anyway. Um. Do, 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 do. So that was in the chairman's letter in the month's report that um, Tree tried to show. I'm sorry I'm going through these so weirdly. These were mostly just quotes that I pulled together to give reason. Anyway, so in the month's report, they said that alongside harvestables, the team looked into consumables that players can find throughout Pyro to keep them alive. And the harvestables is a very, I believe it's also a downstream team. Yeah, if I remember correctly. And I forget which team does it, but the harvestables team. 
I don't think there's a specific team. I think it's <laughs> they're part of some. Yeah, it's uh, the Interactables team. There it is. Interactables team. They are so they are they are a downstream team, which means they're they're if they're telling us about them on the progress tracker, we're within a quarter of their work. The whatever they're working on being done. So they really wanted at the end of twenty. This was in August. This monthly report. So the Interactables team was finishing up their work to make sure that players could stay alive in Pyro. They really thought this was going to be done in 2022. So all the work on top of that has been a plus. Moving on to the next uh, link, or the next point. In the monthly report for April 2022, it says, Elsewhere, the second round of content for the initial release of the new Colonial Outpost is nearing its final. The outpost will soon be the start, or will soon start to dis- be distributed across the power system. Again, this was in April, 2022, for its readiness for the release debut. Again, this was still assuming that it was going to qu- come out in the at the end of 2022, Pyro that is. And then finally, the last part I have about anything being mentioned about planet content was in the monthly report. August 2021. This is out of order for some gosh darn reason. I don't know how I managed to do that. Anyway. Lighting also also assisted planet content making a pass in the atmospheric and color grading setting for Pyro's planets and moons, helping to make each feel unique and interesting. So, all of these things are every note that I had on the planets of Pyro. Oh. Even the harvestables. What? No, I, I know what you're getting at now. I remember from when okay. we talked. Okay. This is the last time Pyro had any planet work. This was 18 months ago. They said they could build a system in two. All the following reference to Pyro has been shops, stations, characters, or whatever. Not the planets. Assuming the bulk of the work was done on planets, it took them eight months. From the first time we saw it to the last time we heard about it. For a whole system, eight months of planets. That's not just a planet. That's not rebuilding planets with assets you have. That is start to finish eight months. And that was years ago, shortly after releasing Planet Tech V4. The Planet Tech team is, or the Planet's team, whatever, whoever's building planets, wherever, wherever their job is, they're not <clears throat> sitting around doing nothing. Yeah. And the, the important part is to, to, to mention that it took them two months to redo all of Stanton in, you know, with Planet Tech V4. Um, with assets, it, with art assets they already had. Yeah, using Planet Tech V4, they they are able to do that, and then the with you know creating new art assets, you know, for Pyro and everything, adding to that asset pack, um, you know, it essentially you know it took them six to eight months to make the planets, uh, you know, planets and moons, and since then we haven't heard about them making new planets, you know, other than just like downstream teams continuing to polish those sort of things, but the the the, the point is this is them demonstrating what the flight time is to create planets and moons. And if they have the flight time to create planets and moons with the small team that they had working on planets back then, um, and still prior to, you know, them building up the sandbox teams and the location teams and, uh, and everything, the, that's how you go from what flight time is, how long it takes you to do something with one set group of people to throughput, which is how many of these things can you do with multiple teams of people doing the same thing? So you don't just have one team working on planets and building planets, and it takes them, you know, four or six months, you know, eight months to build a SAR system. You have four, five, six teams within the sandbox team building planets and filling them with stuff. You know, because the, the sandbox teams have, you know, people who build planets, they have people who make space stations and, um, you know, and other locations, you know, in, in space and on the planet and everything. But that's how this all works out. 
Yeah, they have the river guy. So river guy created procedural tools to populate planets with rivers. Well, now he can just basically click a button and based off the terrain of a planet that's already generated, it will tell, you know, it'll spawn rivers and the rivers will do their thing. And, you know, the that that's how all this works is they have been creating and working on the tools and the pipeline in order to be able to get their flight time in order to create an individual asset, you know, a certain type of asset done in a shorter period of time and then hire and then they grow CIG by you know, a factor of two, you know, based off their projections, you know, and where they are right now from when they announced that they're going to be, you know, investing into a whole bunch of growth. And that is what allows you to increase your throughput, you know, dramatically by having so many yeah. more people building these things, using the tools and the, um, pipelines that you've already developed yeah the the tech teams that have, that have been building these tools have not been building the tools just for speed but also as we uh saw in the video earlier higher quality so rivers were not in the calculation for stanton or pyro so what i just ran through but now we have perfectly simulated rivers they run downhill they have river beds they have rocks on the side they have cliffs even but that didn't take them but a couple seconds of fly time because that was brought on to the standard they need it in addition so now that they have their goal they now can say okay we want to add this tech but it needs to work with the entire rest of the suite so click planet click or like ms paint terrain click rivers planet done and the tech teams will continue to build more tools to have higher quality uh planets faster and of more variety Mm -hmm. whether that be you know jungles or ocean uh, under under land rivers water caves is what i mean (laughs) <laughs> uh, like whatever they whatever they start adding, the tech teams will have a version for them to use that will not inhibit the flight time. Yeah, they will have the tool ready to go before. Okay, hey, we're we want to work on this system at this point, and in order to do that, we need a tool to do this, this, and this. Okay, and they'll work on that tool well in advance. They'll work on the pipeline for it, and then you know when it's you know ready for you know, production, they'll hand it over to the teams and they will make that, you know, as part of the system. But that, you know, this is what we're trying to, to lay out is that, you know, with, you know, we talked about with spacecaping, you know, how they can very quickly make all these nebula and make the nebula look different and varied from one system to another. Same thing with asteroids, you know, that that's part of the, the spacecaping and they can do the same thing with planets and moons, you know, planetary terrain, you know, in order to build planets uh, on which to put things for players to explore and build on very, very, very quickly. And then it's on to other teams to build the locations um, both in space, within the spacecaping, as well as on the planetary and, and moon locations. And um, that's what we're going to go yeah. on to next. But uh, that's what, yeah. you know, it, it, it's when you when you put all these pieces together when you've been reading all this stuff over and over again and watching these videos over and over again like naz and i have been doing for years it all starts to click and you're like oh gosh it makes so much sense and then everybody when everybody says oh cig doesn't have a plan and they're just <laughs> flying by the seat of their pants and they're like they we just showed you just a few clips short clips of them telling you what the plan is and then demonstrating how they're going about implementing the plan and how it yeah. all works and as far as the uh, Knicks releasing one to two or two to three quarters after Pyro, the I highly doubt that CIG would put out another star system on static server meshing. They already have the system they need. They're not going to burn more money for the heck of it. They'll wait till they get dynamic, then add in more systems because they don't want to burn money mm-hmm. on a low player count. Yeah, that's the that's part of the issue is. You can't just they continue just to add empty ground. space, and then when while while server meshing is static, you know if you add another system that is, you know that that requires four more servers, you know as part of that shard, and then there's hardly anyone in there. You're you're just paying money for servers that you don't need. 
that's why they need to progress it static. Yeah, it's it, it's a it's a money thing, because otherwise they're paying Amazon just crap tons of money, and we all already do that. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave them a ton of money when I built this new tower. So yeah, yeah. But the the uh, the, this is just a part of the the overall picture. Um, but now we're going to move on to one of my favorite things, and it, it's really hard to pick because Nazareth and I, we've both, we, we've done segments on Mighty Bridge and the Procedural Locations tool and Rastar before. And I don't know which one I like better because um, Rastar no. is the one that we're going to be doing, you know, have for players, but the Procedural Locations tool, based off the way they've described it, is what they'll be using for, they, they already use it for space stations. Um, it, 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 it looks like it's what it's, they're going to be using for, and I'll, I'll go under how they talk about it and describe it, but they're underground yeah. facilities as well. Um, and assumedly asteroid facilities, which is what I, you know, if you're, if you've been around in star citizen for a while, um, you remember the old asteroid hangar and I want that back. I want asteroid yes. facilities like that. I where you my pull, back. Yeah. You, you, it's like a. It's like a um, Grim Hex, but different, you know, and, so, you know, different sizes, like how they talked about with underground facilities, small, medium, large. Yeah. So where we've talked about how they're going to make the servers able to support more place, more places faster. We've talked about how they're going to space escape faster. We've talked about how they're going to make plants faster. This, what Trey's about to talk about, is how they're going to make POIs faster. So points of mm -hmm. interest, places to go and see. So we've already talked about, like, they've done a few clicks and they have a nebula. Two months and they have an entire star system. Now we're going to see how fast they can make a point of interest. Yep. Um, and this is just one way that they make points of interest. This is, uh, Rastar is another way that they make points of interest, but they're also planning on us being able to use it for different points of interest. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about both. Um, so... Oh, it did it again. You <laughs> son of a biscuit. Control, control that, control that, just control it. Oh, yeah, no, that, but that means I have to go back and find, let's see, which part was I looking for? Montreal Tool Team. There we go. Uh, mighty. So, mighty, this was the January 2022 um, uh, monthly report. And... Um, so this one was really interesting because this is when the Montreal tools team, which very newly formed, this team has been at this point is less than a year old and they completed the mighty bridge tool. So the mighty bridge tool is the integration of Houdini into the editor. So the editor is where they build the game. Um, and specifically I mentioned Houdini because they use it for uh, a a lot of design devs, artists, and designers use Houdini for a lot of different things. But I mentioned Houdini back when we were talking about spacecaping because they use Houdini for the um, uh, the gas clouds. And so now they have taken the um, by by building my the Mighty Bridge tool and integrating Houdini in the editor. They can create gas clouds in the editor. They don't have to create it in Houdini. They they already built this pipeline. Part of the crew, part of the ship. 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 Did the it looked like the sound of was playing? <gasps> you weren't following. Oh, Paul, my heart it weeps. <laughs> 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 welcome, welcome. Um. So yeah, the, the, the Mighty Bridge tool it integrates Houdini directly in the editor. So just by creating this tool and being able to integrate Houdini in the editor, it allows them to take workflows and pipelines that they've already developed for things like spacecaping for gas, gas clouds and do it directly into the game editor. So that way that you don't you lose all that time importing things and then finding out it didn't import the way you wanted. Um, uh, and uh, Paul, thank you for the follow. I much appreciate it. Um, but you know, it, it saves, it's a, it, it really improves the, the workflow for anything that you're doing with Houdini. 
and it allows them to take tools that they use in Houdini and use them in the editor. And it saves a whole lot of time by not having to go back and forth between the editor and Houdini. Um, so we're going to watch a, a little clip real quick. It was right here. And uh, yeah, 251, make sure. There we go. Oh. And listen to the, the language. I have the, the subtitles up there. Their needs. One recent example of a tool we developed is the Mighty Bridge. Mighty Bridge is a plugin for the game editor that link the game editor to any other software. Right now, the main usage is to be able to um, work in Houdini and have some effects directly in editor. With the Mighty Bridge, the communication is done in two-way direction. It can send information and ask stuff to Houdini, for example, and Houdini, while doing the computation, is able to say, OK, you want to place a cave here? Give me all the objects in this 50 meters radius so that I can adapt the recipe and then send back the result. And with other technology, you don't have that two-way communication. So it's also help us do, doing more complex recipe and adapt the content to the game level. The reason why the Mighty Bridge is important is uh, there is a lot of uh, technical resources and knowledge in all kinds of uh, amazing tools, like, as I mentioned before, Houdini. And uh, by providing a way that uh, artists can interact with the editor from the tools that they know and love and have learned to use over many, many years, they can make more easily the stuff that they want. There's no time. All right, I think that was it. So the the first iteration of Mighty Bridge yeah, allowed them to hook up Houdini to the editor, but it's also being used to hook up other tools into the editor. So that way you can work directly, you know, in the editor, in your tools in order to get things, you know, that you're, you're building, you know, and you're used to building via pipelines that are already established and they automatically go right into the editor and there isn't a whole bunch of downtime in between. And so that's why Mighty Bridge is, is so dang cool. And if you saw, let's see, they, they showed examples of Mighty Bridge at work, basically taking recipes, uh, Mighty Bridge as part of the procedural location school tool, taking a recipe that is made by a location designer in order to generate a location. And it, literally it builds it for it, you know, as part of this tool. You know, and it's just incredible the, the functionality that it has. So, um, oh, dang it. Did it get it out of order? But yeah, the, it, it's, um, and what, uh, one more quote that I didn't pull up, but they mentioned, um, you know, it removes the downtime between software and the editor with imports and exports, but future, they're also future proofing Mighty Bridge so that they can plug in other software such as Blender, VS Max, Maya and Substance Designer. So it's not just the locations teams, it's also the teams that use those other pieces of software for anything that they are creating for the game. Um, and I'm not familiar with a lot of those softwares, but I've heard them mentioned by different teams creating all sorts of different things, whether it's weapons. Um... Oh, who did that thing? Mm. If you don't already, yep, shout out who did that. Somebody must have did the shout out to Astropub. So you can, I think you can click that thing in order to follow Astropub if you're not already. I hope everybody here is already following Astropub. If if not, hurry up and click that button. Um, uh, that I opens the page. Cool. Oh, uh, okay. I've never done that thing. That's how you know that I'm I'm not a professional like Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it... it it's crazy because they're using that tool to improve the workflow of every team, not just the locations team, but we're talking about the locations team right here. So it's, this one was the March 22. There we go. Um, so this is March of 2022, just a couple months later. 
Um, on the technical art side, two major areas of development progress. The first is the procedural location tool, which will speed up the production of certain locations. The team are currently designing the tool's template system to allow the designers and artists to procedurally generate various locations, such as derelict outposts and settlements. So taking these settlements and the outposts that are created uh, via Rastar and being able to procedurally generate the derelict ones, um, as well as caves and underground facilities. And so you saw um, in that video um, the, uh, the the cave generation that was going on, the rocky cave generation, but they're also going to be using this for underground facilities. The ones that we saw at CitizenCon that we're going to be seeing the white box of uh, on Thursday, the, the white box tour of, that's being done using the procedural location tool. And they're building it so that way um, we'll get to a clip here at the end and you'll be able to see what their plan is, what their, their goal is with the procedural location tool for these types of things. And they're already doing it for derelict outposts and settlements. So you know how we only got a couple the first time around and now we have dozens as part of 318? Well, soon they're going to be able to do it and, and add a whole lot more. But it's they're working on the workflow for all these things. So that way they can go from making a handful of them to being able to make just ungodly amounts of them um, you know, procedurally. So the next one, the next quote from the mother report, the, ah, it did it again. There we go. I don't know why it just scrolled up just a little bit. Um, so this was from the May month report. So just a couple months later, the procedural location tool is also progressing well. The foundation is now a lot stronger and the team have begun creating basic layouts. They've also moved to supporting corridors and corridor loops, as well as supporting the various required templates. Various required templates, space stations, caves, underground facilities, etc. And the team's current goal is to get V1 to the designers and artists so they can gather feedback and get it production ready. And did it the same thing again. Um, and this is the June month report, just the next month later. This is how fast Montreal works. They are just gobbling up the poutine laced with meth and, and just creating tools in, in rapid succession so that way the Montreal locations tool the t uh, team um, the sandbox teams they're going to add more and more of these teams can create tons and tons of locations and POIs on the technical art side the procedural location creation tool is progressing well with the team expecting to put the first version into the hands of the team soon advancements were made to a suite of asset scattering and environment uh, environmental integration tools. For example, the first prototype will be a tool to create a destruction trail behind a crashed spaceship in derelict settlements. Instead of having to edit by hand, the environment artist will be able to draw a spline that will automatically create the trail before adjusting a set of variables to make the trail look exactly how they want. This type of tool can represent great gains in productivity. For example, by creating a trail by hand, uh, creating a trail by hand took an artist about a week. This tool should reduce the time to half a day. Yeah, meth lace poutine. Woo! I had poutine yesterday um, at a restaurant we went to. Uh, what's coming March that ships are coming on going on sale again? What do they call the in-game event um, with the green that's supposed to represent like Stella Fortuna? Uh, Stella Fortuna. There you go. That's March, right? Whenever yeah. St. Patrick's Day is, yeah. Yep. Um, so any any green ship is going on sale. That's how they work. Mm-hmm. But that's why the it's crazy that they just started working on this tool at the beginning of 2022, and you know they're rapidly adding features to it and getting feedback on it and implementing it so that way they can put it into full production in a matter of months. Here we are again, back at the top, not where I want it to be. So August 2022, like less than you know, not even a half a year after um, you know, starting work on the procedural locations tool. They are at this point, they're six months also uh, uh, after for releasing the first version of Mighty Bridge. You know, and so they're adding more and more functionalities to Mighty Bridge and they're adding more and more functionality uh, to the procedural locations tool. The team is nearing completion of the first version of the procedure, procedural locations tool six months after the first version of Mighty Bridge is out. That's how quickly they were able to get this going. And this will allow them to create and edit simple layouts of space stations in minutes and will dramatically decrease the time it takes to make stations out of existing modules. So they've built, they, 
they have all these artists making content and making modules in order to input them into the the tools so that way designers can take the tool and create a layout boom it's it's basically done methyl and poutine <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> um they're also in the final push of the first version of the tool that will help create direct derelict settlements. So there's tools within the procedural locations tool. You know, it's just like if you're working, you know, with, um, you know, Premiere or who, or, um, uh, Photoshop, you know, there's different tools within the, that, that tool that you use to create something. Um, create derelict settlements. The goal of this iteration is to be able to create this iteration. The goal of this iteration, so they're not done, but this is one iteration, they're continuing to work on it. But the goal of this iteration is to be able to create 80% of derelict settlements procedurally. This heavy lifting will allow the artist more time to polish and finish the location. Reaching this goal will mean that a derelict settlement will take weeks rather than months to create. So they want all these things to line up so that way, you know, the planet's are getting done in a matter of months. And each time a planet gets done, these people on the sandbox teams come behind with their set of tools and they've got, you know, within a matter of months, they fill the planet up with POIs. Same thing with space, you know, around the planets and the moons. So that way the entire system is done in a matter of, you know, months um, by one team working on one system while another team you know, or another group of with a host of teams is working on another system. So they've got these things going in parallel. Yeah, we will see. I imagine we'll see planet teams or teams that encompass all of the necessary requirements for space, for planets, for locations, for missions, rolled up into single teams and put in parallel like we have now the three ship teams. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So we'll yeah. be getting, just like we get, I don't know, a couple, a dozen or so ships a year, we'll be getting that kind of speed once all these procedural tools and server meshing, mm -hmm. the foundation of being able to put in multiple star systems, is in. So post server meshing V2 or uh, dynamic V2, the amount of speed that they can churn out planets and POIs and things is just mind-boggling and we're not even done with the presentation yet yeah when you and, and when you have a a cig that is 1300 plus devs versus a cig that is 700 plus devs you can imagine what the throughput will look like as far as star systems with all of these tools available to them you know, when you have multiple sandbox teams and each one is working on a different star system and each one can turn out a star system, you know, in, in, you know, a quarter, you know, three to four months, you know, and you've got several of those teams, you're looking at, you know, multiple, you know, each team being able to create, you know, two to three, maybe four star systems in a year and having multiple of those teams, you're looking at, you know, six, seven, eight, ten star systems each, you know, each year once they get all this stuff ramped up, but that's what they're ramping up to do. That that's the picture that we're we're that they are painting. You know, we're just relaying the information to you in a, a easy to a more easy to understand and contextual environment. And here's the another clip um regarding uh Mighty Bridge that I thought was interesting. And closed captioning is on. We'll show the transcript make sure we're at the right spot 337 we didn't already watch this one did we wait yeah we did inside sources and tools time yeah we did why did it open up twice okay so this is the example that is on the turbulent website for how they go about using the procedural location tool with the integration um, from Houdini to make a space station, yeah, essentially a rest and relax. That is procedural generation of a space station with all the modules in it based off the recipe. And they just tell it to generate a layout. 
And what they can do is they can create the exterior of a space station and say, here is the interior volume you have to work in. Here are the connection points you have for the elevators, you know, and the hangers and stuff. Um, and then boom, click. And this thing will design the interior of the space station to fit, you know, what you have already built with, you know, the, they show, remember, you know, that has the, the weird lighting and, and all that for the, the like shopping area with all the things that are supposed to be within that recipe for the space station, your clinic, um, your shopping area, the HABs, uh, all that set of stuff gets procedurally added to it. And all these things are tied to it in a logical, fa you know, uh, they're all tied together in a logical fashion. You know, they don't just humble jumble throw them together. They throw them together. So that way it makes sense the way they are laid out. Mm -hmm. And then it just uh, works. Ghost said, what if they don't stop at a hundred? They can do it. Oh, easily. I don't think they will. There's yeah. only 85 star systems on the map with a stretch goal saying there's a, th there's a hundred. Yeah. Why does the endeavor have a deep space telescope? And especially when those are the known star systems, the ones that we know that are inhabited by the known races. Uh, we don't know anything about the Kurthok. We don't know where they are. We don't know where their star systems are. Um, and I guarantee you, you know, we're not going to be finding uh, new star systems regularly, but I, I guarantee you with how fast they can create an empty star system. Cause imagine you just had the planets in the space gaping. There's no POIs. You know, or anything like that. There, there's no, you know, um, sentient alien we, presence or anything like that. The, you we can know get there's that more star system Vandual done quickly. Systems yeah. Their way. And the Banu yeah. have tons of systems that we don't know of, just because they don't keep the planets they've been yeah. to. Because unless there's yeah, anything it's... notable, they don't keep. Yeah, there's there's no reason they'll stop at a hundred, and I, I I guarantee you we'll probably have a couple new star systems get added to the game that are empty and newly discovered. And, you know, as part of gameplay, we'll have to support terraforming projects um, and, and bring supplies in for the, you know, construction of space stations and, and you know, POIs and what have you, you know, and And, and Chris be... has said, like, as long as the game has money to build, it will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, this, that also means that he is building a company, which it always seems that his, uh, his higher up can can run the company um continually so hopefully even after chris builds what he wants and is done and we keep playing our descendants keep playing they will continue to be building more star citizen not just another star citizen but more star citizen oh i could have sworn i got the link with the timestamp. Mm -hmm. we're on oh okay yep we're in the right spot all right cool um okay and it's back to you for rastar I'm going to open up the last. So, where have we okay. just completed the Mighty Bridge and Procedural Location? Rastar is an additional procedural tool that kind of is shoulder to shoulder with those two. But the fun thing about Rastar is it's not just for the devs. They've actually said that we're going to get this, this piece of technology in the form of player base building. So. We have a little uh, video to watch in Crafting Worlds, Planetary Tools, and Tech. Make sure we're at the right timestamps. Okay. All right. So turn sound on, got closed captions on, and timestamps, thank God we have them, but sometimes they are difficult. What is Rasta? Rasta is our work-in-progress tool for planetary locations, creation, and addition. The name stands for a mix uh, of RTS, the game jaw, which takes the inspiration from its map editor system, and Star, as, well, you know. 
Its goals <laughs> are to replace our previous placement system based on prefabs to a better object container oriented solution. As our previous system was based on prefabs, any changes to location was source of issue, as it needs to re-enable the whole set of data to have things like missions or shops to work again. With this new system, any change will be easily manageable and won't require us to redo work when a change is made. Plus, as it's now object container oriented, it can be used for outpost, case, or even derelicts, and more. It works as a modular system where locations will in fact be made of small elements that will be placed just like you do in City Builder RTS Editor. In a matter of minutes, we now have a new location where we can now create a bunch of cool gameplay. Let's go to Mark, who will tell us about the connector system. Thanks, Morgan. So, I'm Mark. I'm also a tools developer for the Planet Tech team. Do you know what's better than placing everything by hand? Not placing everything by hand. In order to do that, we use what we call connectors. Basically, artists create small parts of homesteads that we can then snap together. Every part is modular, so we can uh, interchange multiple ones in order to have uh, procedural homesteads. Every change is very simple. We can change like, the whole inside of a homestead or only a building that is a part of the homestead. In that way, it's very easy to make a lot of different buildings. Once something is connected, it is considered a part of the whole. So it moves as one, it can be deleted and changed, and it's basically all for connectors. <laughs> so uh, back to you, Morgan. And last but not least, some of you might have noticed that the UI is not looking quite like an engine UI. And that's normal, as it's based on our in-game UI tech building blocks and that for a reason. Well, today it's being used by our developers. One day, when it's ready and been roughly tested internally, we'll make a version available to you, the player. And Rasta, it's what will make you a pioneer. Thank you for watching. We are very excited about the tech we've shown you today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of Digital Citizen Con. I've watched that so many damn times. <laughs> all right. So, quite a long clip, but I'm glad it's all in there. So, they're well, able to, with Rats. Monthly reports, you know, that you know, we. Please, please. Uh, here, the. Share, copy. This is the whole so, link, not timestamp, but it's not a very long one. So, like they said, the goal is to replace the prefab system with the object oriented or object container oriented solution so that every time they need to make a change, whether that's adding or removing items, changing the look of it, adding a room for whatever reason, they don't have to re basically re render the entire settlement. All they need to do two clicks rooms changed or the overlay is changed or whatever they need to do. The modular system allows them to rapidly place all of these small elements around, giving a new location. You saw at the end, matter of minutes, complete new location done. So when they get a planet done for the first time, all they got to do, place a dot, place a couple buildings, place the overlays on them, location done, moving on. Mission team can come in and start building out missions but we'll also talk about how they're going to make missions faster and more of them later on artists create uh small parts of a homestead now not just entire buildings and then they use what they call the connector system to just center ed room over here room over there it's not quite as modular as the stations are but modular enough to where it's very easy to make a completely different looking area. And that's only with the single look that they have, the colonial outposts that I've been working with for Pyro. And like I said, one day when it's ready and been thoroughly tested internally, we'll get a version of this to make our own bases. So it's working double duty for a super fast way to make outposts and eventually 
underground facilities and cities. We're going to be able to use this tool to build our own stuff. Uh, let's see, I believe now we have another video. Uh, November 3rd, Inside Star Citizen, the cargo show. Okay, the go. Oh. Star, the internal tool that we've been developing for here talking about new technologies designed to be Star. built upon from one patch to the next. Let's chat us up some Rastar. The internal tool that we've been developing now that's currently in use, placing outposts throughout both the Stanton and Pyro systems. The whole purpose of Rasta is to make the thing easier for the devs to place location at the surface of a planet. And in the end, it will be used as the system for player to build their bases. We have Rasta because the previous system, based on Prefab, was quite uh, hard to use and not up to scale for the, um, for the scale uh, and the scope we want for our planet density. Any changes to the planetary generation, like for example, you just change a canyon, you add a canyon to the planet, you'll have to redrop every uh, module at the surface of a planet to be sure they are well aligned with the new terrain and the new modifications of the terrain. Rasa makes that better by uh, allowing, first of all, the ability to directly follow the modification of terrain topology, so we don't have to refresh anything. Plus, it gives us more granularity and modularity of the locations. Backers should be caring about the Rasta and all these improvements because that's the way we will be able to give you, the players, the most dense area we can imagine to keep in line and have all the planets, all the moons filled with POI and things to do on the surface and maybe later in orbit of these planets and moons. CitizenCon 2951. It changed not much in terms of visual, mostly UI rework, but features are all there. Just a lot of internal work to allow the new build location to fit more and be more productive. So now we can have modules and elements that are nested and indented so we better understand what depends on what. And we also added the ability to collapse parts of the tool, so to have a better understanding and more focused work on some parts of the tool. We also worked on better tools integration, so now we are able to use the base tools of the editors, such as Gizmos or Rollerbar, to modify some elements of Rasta, which was not possible previously due to some breaking while doing so and to keep consistency with the um, with the rasta flow but with that changes now most of the in edited tools are usable with rasta without any risk we also moved the object containers used for rasta to streaming object containers to keep in line with the whole streaming process of the network system so now we gave the ability for the server to load and spawn and despawn some locations and elements at will to avoid crowding the whole server memory. And we also now converted the whole connector system that was presented during the last CitizenCon to item ports. So now, again, to keep in line with the in-house way we do things and to better integrate some elements such as the resource network that will later resource network resource management so not only did they make it work so that way it works with pes in order to make it more performant on server meshing but also they are integrating it with the they've made it work with the item port system and resource management just like how ships will work and stations in every location it'll be available on the locations i'm quite happy with the result of rasta there is quite some work to do on it 
but the result is promising and I'm pretty sure you're gonna love the location we will roll out with uh, Rasta. So what did we learn? So cool. So dang cool. I'll share that link as well. So. To review. They are, well, we didn't get to it, but. They are currently being used to populate buildings for 318. There's something that Jared said in the little last part. The entire purpose is to make it easier for devs to make it. Is for to make it easier for devs to place locations and POIs. Like I said, the goal of Rastar for now is to make the second they get a planet done, to fill it with POIs so that we have something to do or a place to go on a planet. And some of the uh, refinements that they have made from the last time, the last video we watched, is now when they update the planet, if any changes need to be made to the planet, Let's say the location or the, the landing zone team said they needed to place something in the, in the location and update the planet uh, topology. They would have to reset every single outpost. Now, just update. Fine. Perfectly fine. Um, they now have a more granular modularity. So there's easier to do. The, all the UI has been updated to be easier to use. Again, this will help devs be faster and faster. They had mentioned that for now it's on the ground. Later, they all he's moving stuff in orbit. Um, they didn't mention it in those clips. I forget where it was that they said it, but I know they said it that they plan on using Rastar to build cities. It's on the tile, on the progress chart. Is it on the tile? Uh, I think it's on see. the tile. Now the resource management is. Uh, they also have now streaming containers so the server can unload and load them. They updated the connector system to now be item port system, so with all the conventions of CIG. And a big one, like they had talked about a lot of this for outpost, 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 resource management. Now, Rastar works with resource management. And for now, that means the power plant of the settlement you go to will shut off the lights. But that will later mean that your all your elements that you can post place around your built base, whether that be data banks, engines, solar panels, uh, refineries, mining facilities, uh, storage containers, cranes, whatever they put as elements you can place, is all going to be hooked up using the same system that our ships will be using, that a city will be using, that a star system will be using, that a station will be using. This resource network system is probably one of the biggest additions as far as gameplay goes to star citizen it's far bigger than people give it credit for and absolutely we're talk about next in this next clip right and as i said they're already been using raster we have stuff in raster from raster in 318 mm -hmm. it's in a state where there's already products of it so now the last tree part resource management so we're just going to watch the first clip of this part and it's from the power play video from citizen gone 2952 last year last october but we're just going to watch this first bit um because it, it, it's the the first the, the quote at the beginning is the really it, the what i wrote down is you know is this perfectly illustrates how it is all holistic Rastar and procedural locations feeding into quantum, procedurally generating the economy and gameplay as new star systems are added by using the resource management or resource network system. Hi, my name is Dan Truffin. I'm assistant director for PU Content and with uh, Thorsten Lyman here today, we will be talking to you about something we think uh, it will change the way Star Citizen functions and works and how the players will play the game uh, in the future. And that is resource management. Resource management is the underlying system that allows uh, items to produce, consume, and store 
uh, resources in the game. It is the digital representation of real life cables, pipes, uh, tanks, batteries, or anything like this that you can imagine. It's the foundation of the ships where you have certain resources like fuel and energy powering certain items on the ship, but it's also uh, the system that will lie below any station or any vehicle, anything that you can imagine in our universe that actually requires a certain type of resource. Resource management is not just a system that helps the ships function. It is a thing that's integral to the functionality of the entire universe. It will be the way uh, surface outposts function, underground facilities, space stations, landing zones, everything in Star Citizen will function using resource management. So we will start with the smaller vehicles and it will the gameplay for those smaller vehicles way more interesting than what we have right now. And from that we can move on to like bigger ships and finally the capital ships will have a real purpose in the world and where it will have a real meaning that uh, you have the multiple roles inside those ships. It will drastically increase the time. Rewatch Imagine in our universe that actually requires a certain type of resource. Resource management is not just a system that helps the ships function. It is a thing that's integral to the functionality of the entire universe. It will be the way uh, surface outposts function, underground facilities, space stations, landing zones, everything in Star Citizen will function using resource management. So we will Everything in Star Citizen will function using resource management. So we talked about the way that outposts are going to get built. We talked about the way that astro the like space stations are already built using the procedural locations tool. And they're going to use that tool for building, um, well, Rastar for outposts and homesteads, procedural locations tool for um, space stations, underground facilities, asteroid facilities, Rastar for cities, um, all that. You know, the, these tools are being built in a way that they're holistic. They're not just a way, you know, something that's interesting to look at and, and visit. But like he talked about in the Rastar presentation, how um, the it has the item port system, just like the, the procedural location tool uses the item port system um, <clears throat> in order to connect up to the resource, you know, resource network. So that way um, you have supply and demand. You have you know, if you have your refinery, like Nazareth talked about, on a at an outpost, that refinery is gonna you know has a recipe for creation of whatever it's you know whatever it's refining or whatever it can refine, and in order to do that, you know, you have to put in power and you know the the you know the other aspects of the recipe in order to create something. Just like on a ship, in order to create thrust. You have to, you know, put fuel in, you know, into the the ship, and the power plant has to take that fuel and turn it into to energy. And you have to, you know, it, it ionize, you know, creates ionized gas for the thruster. That's how all this this works. And it's it's an it's just a recipe system for th you know for the item port system. So that way, anytime a location is is created, whether it's using Rastar or the procedural locations tool, whether it's something as small as your outpost that you made yourself or something as big as a city, a city with all of its production nodes, like we talked about back in this presentation, you know, the various production nodes, you know, it, it all ties into it. So that way, you know, if you have the production node for art core that makes power plants, okay, well, that power plant requires power, it requires, you know, um, labor, it requires ingredients that are brought to it, you know, from refineries and such like that in order to generate an output, which is, you know, power plants that is, you know, then, and all of those things are fed back into to quantum, you know, it's all tied in together. And that's how you get the dynamic content that Tony Z was talking about made dynamically, automatically, just by having locations using the resource network and resource management system and then players interacting with it, you know, and, and, and quanta, you know, and, and that's why this is so just nuts because it's a, it, it's an entirely holistic system where they're building the, the planets, they're building the star system and the space in between, they're building the planets and the moons and the asteroid fields and, you know, uh, the, the nebula and, um, you know, the, 
um, gas clouds and such. And then they're putting points of interest in space down on the planets and moons. And then all those things are interconnected, you know, using resource management and quantum. So we, we knew that resource management for a long time was going to be used for ships, for multi-crew gameplay, for engineering. This presentation right here was the first time when they explained to us the much broader capacity for resource management and how it's so much bigger and how it's tied into everything and how it, it along with quantum ties everything together. Um, and then NASA, you know, but that's, you know, this is what we have for resource management. And that's, you know, that's why this quote is so important to me because everybody, you know, it's, these locations aren't just locations to visit. They're ingredients in quantum. Uh, what was the timestamp? Okay, we got it. 1248. Now, and this is our last clip. Yeah, last section, last clip. Not much to say here, but there's important stuff to say here. So we know that there's going to be really fast space caping. Built, all this is going to be built on server meshing. We know that they can build the entire star system worth of planets in two to eight months. We know that they can make POIs in a couple minutes. But that's all just space. That's all just an area to run around. How do we get the gameplay? Because unless you have gameplay, everything's going to be just boring. It's just going to be sightseeing. So how are they going to make enough gameplay? That, like Tree said, is where Quantum comes in. Now, there's no good end point on this video. So we're just going to play it for a little while and then explain some stuff. But I highly recommend you guys watch right. this. It, it technically is. It's Like I said, there's no good end point. I tried to Fail get into its calculation. a good dense part of it. Because mm -hmm. this entire video is literally how they're going to build quantum into a thing that generates gameplay procedurally. So go ahead and play till somewhere around before they start talking about um, uh, what is it? Uh, before well, they start talking about the mission grabs. Yep. So it looks like it's about to yep right there including what any information you eventually attempt to sell would be worth yeah quantum has now been pretty thoroughly integrated into our back-end architecture and the service will be built and shipped with all future releases of the game which took a considerable amount of time and effort given how different some of its tools and technologies were versus what we had already set up and configured there's still a tremendous amount of work to do on the simulation side, but we are getting close to the point at which portions of its simulated data will be an improvement over the algorithmic logic embedded into various services. We're going to do a bit more testing before we enable it to start injecting that data into the live game though. And even then we're gonna start very small and limit the focus to a few select areas so that we can work out any problems. The first couple of commodities for which Quantum will gain the ability to dictate the price will be fuel and repair materials. We're also going to allow it to control the amount of piracy and possibly transport freighters and security in a few test locations. But keep in mind that until more of the data behind the curtains is exposed, the modulation may at times seem a bit arbitrary. We're going to be more aggressive with service beacons and we'll soon move most of that responsibility, the type of beacon being offered, the location, the reward, and the difficulty to quantum. Our primary focus right now is less on getting a lot of data moving back and forth and more on getting all of the technological plumbing working properly. In order to properly calculate fuel prices, for example, quantum needs to have a concept of fuel, what type of ships quanta are using, and fuel efficiency, none of which it previously had. In order to gauge the demand for repair services, ships in the simulation need a concept of damage, which didn't previously exist. There's often a lot of service work involved in allowing new types of data to flow between quantum and the game. With iCache now largely complete, we've been able to shift some resources around and within the last month have now doubled the number of engineers working on the systemic functionality. As a result, we're now in the early stages of a number of critical new services, including everything from the air traffic control service that's required for server meshing to the MPC scheduler that will enable dynamic populations to the virtual AI service that is necessary for the next major feature I'm going to discuss. Okay, those quotes were very important. All right. So, yeah. Good. <laughs> so, yes, we know. Oof. 
I cash. However, the replacement is the entity graph, also known as what enables PES. Which means that they're going to restart, not restart, but start back up on <laughs> on quantum integration. Not building, but integration into it. We already have had fuel repair, and what's the other one? Um, whatever the third one was. Integrated, whatever the first three was. Integrated into the game. I believe that happened in 317? I think. Um, yeah, the fuel and repair was... Was that 317 in the... Yeah. There was no like was... official note. They just kind of said it. It was 317 or 316. I forget which now because it was so long ago. <laughs> yeah. um, well, we've been on 317 for a year or so. Well, and, and this is really good context because, you know, um, you know, with iCache now largely complete, okay, iCache didn't work out, so they had to pivot and go and invent PES, you know, the replication layer and the entity graph. Um, so, you know, those engineers that they they were hoping for that, you know, that they had planned on having got taken away in order to, you know, get back to work on, you know, okay, we need, we need something else instead of iCash. Um, but he says, and this ties back into the roadmap that we went over at the beginning of the episode, um, working uh, and now doubled the number of engineers working on the systemic functionality. As a result, we're now in the early stages of a number of critical new services, including everything from the air traffic control service, that's required for server meshing, the NPC scheduler service that will enable dynamic populations to the virtual AI service that is necessary for the next major feature I'm going to discuss, which is Bounty Hunter V2. We looked In at some other form, yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> and along with a bunch of other things. So um, we saw the air traffic control service on the progress tracker. We saw the NPC scheduler on the progress tracker. Because those are, you know, being worked on. The, the, the work is resuming now that PES is, PES, is, so August, PES works. Like, we're, we're so it, with it iCache, they didn't know the size hole they needed. They didn't know what peg they had to know which hole they needed. So they built iCache. Then they developed a bit more and they saw, wait a minute iCache, this, this square hole we built, doesn't fit our game, which is this round peg. So, well, it's actually supposed to be the other way around. Anyway, uh, so they built a hole to fit their peg they already had, which is their game. And they knew the scope of their game at the point they needed iCache done. They knew exactly what they were going to have, all the services or all the features that they had planned. They have a much better idea of it back when iCache was supposed to be done than when they started iCash. So, at the end of iCash's development, they said, this is the game we are planning on building. That doesn't work. So let's build a system that works with the game that we have planned. The game, the game has not significantly changed since 2017. Pre-2017, it changed a lot. They were still developing the idea of Star Citizen up to 2017. Since then, there hasn't been a lot of change to what is Star Citizen. So the entire idea of what they want the data to do, how fast they need the data to go, and where the data is going to be concentrated was all already very well known when they said iCache, or yeah, iCache is not going to work. So they said, this is what we need iCache to do now. Let's build a system that does that. And that's PES. It's built to uh, need. They already knew the need. Yeah. So there the... was almost no chance of PES not working because it was built, chosen, engineered specifically because they knew it would work. PES wouldn't have made it into the main game dev branch last summer if it wasn't working already. Now, if the... we didn't have iCache by the time they knew it was going to fail. Yeah. The, the PES having bugs it is just part of development and the fact that you know they're they are scaling it up to more and more people and you know they'll continue to scale it until it's you know 
all the way up and they'll continue to squash bugs and optimize it, but it works. You know, it, it yeah. is a functional yeah. system, you know, but it's, it's also, you know, they just released it to open PTU and, yeah. you know, it's going to take, you know, a while to optimize it and get it to where it needs to be fully functional, you know, as far as being as performant as they want it and stable as they want it and, you know, not have, you know, squash all the bugs and such, but yeah. the squashing of the bugs and the optimization is, you know, an ongoing process. The, 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 the bulk, the big leg work is done and it works. If this was a traditional game, they would have said, okay, there are bugs. It's, it's in development and just ridden with the bugs. Like the fact that they're doing optimization work on PES is only because they run a live environment. Yeah. They would have gone on developing it till they reached their whatever internal beta phase to actually start removing bugs. And it's only because the complexity we're having so much trouble optimizing PES. PES is almost not an issue on the servers. It's, you know, elevators and the tram system. PES, the major bugs with PES were gone within the first few months of wave one. Yeah, our first few months. It's first, all the first services and things that interact with it from the other teams. And so that's what they're yeah. doing right now is going through with all the other teams and continuing to iterate on how their things connect with PES in order yeah, to get PES them stabilized works great. and function. Great. The yeah. fact that you can drop a bottle, go do missions for five hours, log out, log back into the same server, go back to this place you forgot your water, pick it up and move along. You can do that right now. That whole coffee cup in the forest thing that Chris has been talking about for 10 years is a thing in 318. It exists. They did it. It's done. The only difference is they're trying to make people happy with the state of the bugginess of the game. If they didn't have players to... I don't want to say pander to, because that's kind of demeaning, but if they didn't want the game to be playable in a casual sense either, I'm running out of words here, then no, they, they would but they, would have they no need worries. They need us to play it, and they need right. us to play it at scale, so that way they can you know, continue That's to much optimize and you know get things ready for you know when they are um you know when when we go from having you know one hundred and fifty thousand players concurrently to you know millions you know because that you know, I've been in three eighteen I've complained about bugs I, I'm yeah. also demeaning myself don't worry but if they didn't have to make the live environment for me for you for everyone who tried to play the game map system withstanding mm -hmm. then PES would be just nailed in done moved on to whatever the next step is maybe the like whatever they're adding before the server meshing build is ready to actually integrate and that would again break everything and they'd be like yep it's broken you guys work on your stuff we're gonna move on to the next thing instead they're going to put PES in and then now they're gonna put 319 on top of PES the build that is the first build with PES and when we get to maybe a 320, maybe that will be another branch. But definitely 4.0 will be a new branch. And that's going to have a lot of the same growing pains. Sure, server meshing will work in a bubble with only server meshing. But what happens when you shoot across a border? What happens to the bullet? What happens when you throw something across the border? What happens when you drive across the border? What happens when somebody logs off while crossing the border? What happens if five people do it? A thousand people do it? Like, there are some things you can only test so far internally. After that point, it becomes much more feasible to say, hey, how about we release this to 4,000 people and see what kind of crashes we get back? That way we know exactly whose fault it is. And it's probably not server meshing's fault after, you know, the first couple of weeks. Because that is a system that only does a specific number of things. But everyone else attaches to it. So when you have to build a, a function that has all of these things attaching to it, that's when you start getting the problems. And Star Citizen is one of those... Super ambitious projects, like one of the most ambitious projects I've ever seen. It's a complex beast. And there will probably be some of these bugs that we're dealing with with PES show up back 
when we go to server meshing. Show up when they get, you know, five patches after server meshing. Because it's not technically one thing's fault, but something got updated somewhere to where NPCs are standing on chairs again. Some so, bugs come back. <laughs> here's the example. So this is what he this is what he said. So we early stages of a number of critical news services, including everything from the air traffic control service that's required for server meshing. Mm -hmm. So air traffic control service, um, they stopped work on that at the end of June, 2021. This video was in May of 2021 because they had to work on PES. They are, that team is back to work on that. So they added 80 days of work. Um, and so the end date is the beginning of August. So 80 days is essentially, you know, they'll be starting work on that uh, end of May on the ATC service in preparation for server meshing. Um, you know, picking up that work again. The other thing that he mentioned, the NPC scheduler service that will enable dynamic populations because you need dynamic populations for server meshing. You can't have a static population. You know, if a peop if people, uh, if players aren't at a certain location, they need NPCs to um, go away. And so the NPC scheduler service, they stopped work on, they had continued work on that. They yeah, added more work on it last year, but then they stopped work on it last August. They're picking it up again um, at about the same time. You know, shortly thereafter, they start on the ATC service again. Uh, so this will be starting back up in May. Uh, again, uh, to getting ready for server meshing, you know, and and, more, and greater integration of quantum, you know, fall, you know, around the same time server meshing will be coming in. Um, and so the problem with the biggest battle thing is Eve is a much lower quality graphically, not production wise game you never will find oh, an yeah. fps game within eve they've tried and stopped it for failed. good reason not failed but they stopped i'm not gonna call it failed that'd be disingenuous anyway that was seven and a half thousand players and for a lot of the things we haven't said in this show, go watch uh, Ray's guide on absolute dispersion and absolute concentration. Mm -hmm. I forget which video it's actually titled. I have but Ray's the reason... entire series on server meshing, and it's in one of the videos in that, but I have it saved as a playlist that I've gone back and yeah. forth to. Uh, the reason we probably won't get 8,000 people battles is because your graphics card will literally melt because you have to render all those ships and all their bullets and all their physics calculations on your own system. The, the way as that much we as the servers player battles are going to be fine, 8,000 players on a, on a mix of ships, you know, and, and you have multiple, you know, lots of capital ships and lots of smaller ships flying around. And, and the more capital ships, the yeah. better performance is going to be because interior, yeah. uh, interior bind culling, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is basically Ship everyone interior. on the interior gone. Yep. Doesn't need to render anything. Doesn't need to do any. Doesn't need to worry about it. The interior gets streamed up to the server, and the effects of the interior get played out on the exterior, and that's all the other ones see. So if you had like five, you know, I don't know, I don't know how many people per bangle, but let's just say eight bangles, each a thousand players. Done. Finished. Yeah. You can do that. We've seen it's... a bangle. <laughs> it's the way that the the battles, the big battles that you see in Squadron Forty Two, would be able to play out in the in in SC, simply because the your your client doesn't care about all the people on those big ships. It doesn't render them. It doesn't have to compute anything for them. You know, the all your your client cares about is the server telling you where those ships are going and in what direction they're shooting. Um, you know, and what their status is, you know, their, their overall status is. Um, and that's, you know, that's how they're, they're working their way up to it. But, you know, the quantum, you know, uh, uses resource management to tie it all together 
and they are ramping up production on Quantum again because PES is done. And it's in the game and it's working and it needs you know more iteration on, but they don't need 20 people working on it to build the thing. They need a handful of people to continue to iterate on, on it and you know provide support to the other teams for it while those other engineers go on and work on server meshing in Quantum. And they're working on those things in parallel because they are planned to schedule it to work on those things in parallel. So, um, but yeah. And uh, the Bengals only supposed to have up to 755 crew. Yeah. So when you think about it, if you've got like, you know, yeah. Ten. Anyway, it take 10. But yeah, the, the, that's how quantum ties into the resource management system. So that way, if you're, you know, the, the resource management system used on a city that says these production nodes need these resources, quantum gets that information and then is able to generate contracts to supply those resources. And that way either players or NPCs will bring those things to there in order to produce, you know, consume those resources and to produce something else. That's how all these things are tied together. That's the holistic vision that CIG has that they're getting pretty close to putting into, you know, uh, putting into the game. You know, the, these things aren't, aren't just back of the, the napkin at the restaurant. Now they're in full production. A lot of them are, you know, we already have bits and pieces of them in game or are well in game. So it's, it's really, it's a fascinating project because of the way they're looking at all this um and i i um mr uh, mount center thank you for the compliment we really appreciate it but yeah nazareth and i worked really hard on this over the last few weeks um it we we have basically been the guy from always sunny in philadelphia except for there's two of us <laughs> on either sides of the internet doing the same thing yeah we do know. it to our we're our own thing till we come to a dot and then we like get on discord this thing <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. That ties into this. And, you know, yeah. Right. And that's what this whole, you know, the, these tabs, the production into overdrive, space scaping, planet tech, mighty bridge and the procedural location tool, Rastar resource management, quantum. In each one of these tabs, the CIG basically tells us how these things are connected to each other as part of how they build are going to build star systems and have content within those star systems for us to, to use. And they're going to build them at scale. It, it, not not one in ten years, you know. We're you know, one by one, te- one sandbox team in a matter of months, and then the ga- the system gets added to the game and plugged in. Quantum plugs it right in, and it automatically balances and starts generating content with the new system added into it. You know, and, and that's where we're at. 